Okay, friends, here we are again. We have woken up in Silver City, the capital of the kingdom. Our heroes have all leveled up to level two, which is very exciting. I'll run down some things that we added to our party once we take some turns in this next quest. And I realized I had said in the last video I might go ahead and go shopping because I was getting low on arrows specifically, but I realized I had a whole nother quiver in my backpack for Dorlin to use. So I think we'll be okay. We have more arrows than we've used still. So we're going into this next quest with nine arrows, which I think is okay because we've used a handful before. We'll, we'll see if that's enough, I guess. <laughs> so uh, since it's morning, we leveled up overnight. We spent the 25 gold we needed to to spend the night in an inn. And we're going to go ahead and just start quest two without doing any other activities. We've all got more health and our armor has some decent durability still. So I just decided to go ahead and go for it. So this is quest two. We've made our way to Silver City and we are here in the capital following the lead of the undead and we'll see what it has for us. So this is the dead rising. Apparently, it is not only the villages that are visited by the occasional undead. Just like poor Johan, the dead seem to be stirring in Silver City as well. Before long, members from the Brotherhood of Olnir were sighted in the city, apparently requested by the Jarl himself. Their leader was a towering man, a battle-seasoned warrior priest, and with him... He had an old soldier and an alchemist. The three brothers carried themselves with confidence and power, and their appearance proved they could back this with action. They conducted their investigations thoroughly, and the warrior priest Ulfric declared that the root of evil seemed to be within the old mausoleum in the city's cemetery. Together with his brother-in-arms, he entered the mausoleum. That was five nights ago, and not a sound has been heard from the mausoleum. The Jarl of Silver City reaches out to the party, requesting their help. My cousin told me you proved you could handle yourself with that horrendous rat and that poor soul, Johan. Would you consider heading down the mausoleum to get in contact with Ulfric? I know that what I ask will not be easy. The mausoleum is hundreds of years old and it is like a maze down there. But I'm starting to fear that the Brotherhood may have failed. Accepting the quest, the adventurers are now tasked with making contact with Ulfric and his brothers. Once prepared, they start their descent down the dusty stone stairwell, torches in hand and weapons at the ready. So this quest begins with a threat level of four, which is the minimum threat level. And we have to remember that because when we played spring cleaning, I went down to no threat at all, which you're not allowed to do. I think we still had to stay at two threat or something like that for that first quest. So I have to remember that. That's one thing to remember. We also have a maximum threat level, which will be 18. The quest location is here in Silver City. And there are special rules here we'll read. When the threat level reaches 10, a wandering monster will appear regardless of the scenario die result, which is important to remember as well. The number of tiles that we pick are five corridors, excluding C16. We've already done that. I've got some decks set aside up here. Four rooms randomized from R2B to R8B only. And we're going to see the rooms list on the next page. Reward is 150 coins per hero. Encounters are going to be undead. And the objective room is the Great Crypt, which we'll see here. We put it aside. Not that one, this one. <laughs> Just wanted to flip it. Okay. So we'll read this when we get to the objective room. When we draw that card, we have a little bit more here to hang out on. Well, this is just specific to the objective room still, I believe. Here's Ulfric's stat block. Spoilers, we're going to face him. He's probably turned. All right, let's go ahead and set up the dungeon decks and we'll get started. All right, so all of our heroes are ready to knock down this door. It should be wide open for us. All of our exploration cards are right here. So the first thing we need to do is just pick a hero to use an action point to open this door. And I think we will use Neely. We'll start Neely's turn. I'll show you some of the things that we did as he leveled up here. So 
So his HP went up to 14. And let's see what else we have done. We increased combat skill up to 50. We had 15 points to play with just as we did when we made him. Um, and then the talent and perk we picked. Oh, each. Let me say this first. Each. I keep flipping this around. Each hero is now at level 2 with 1 luck and 2 energy. Except for a bomber or halfling, he started with a luck, so he now has 2 luck. And we picked strong-minded because we had lost some sanity, so we got a sanity point back. And we're back up to our max of 10 with him because we rested as well. We also picked encouraging, so if we spend an energy point to use this perk, uh, we'll give comrades plus 10 on an upcoming fear or terror test, which felt pretty good. Because even though he's our, our fraud who lost a lot of stats at the beginning, he does have disciplined and mighty blow. He's got some cool stuff where he's really fighting hard against this reputation that he has. So the first action he is going to take is open a door. And let's see what we have waiting for us behind door number one. Just an empty room, probably meant to be filled with coffins. This room is empty apart from some broken small ceramics. There's a set of levers on one of the walls. The levers can be operated using the rules in the rule book. Cool, we have not come across levers yet. We'll find this tile, get it set up, put a door out, and go from there. We've also set up a side quest here in the dungeon. This is side quest five, Manhunt. We got this from a travel event that we came across on our way into Silver City. Apparently, one of the city guards was killed last night, and the streets are swarming with armed soldiers. They have been combing through every nook and cranny of the city, but to no avail. Posters with sketches of the perpetrator have been posted everywhere. Apparently, the man is missing both an eye and an ear, so he should be easy to identify. It seems anyone who kills the bandit and can prove it will be handsomely rewarded. Unbeknownst to the heroes, the bandit has taken refuge in the very same dungeon to which they are heading. So the quest location is in the dungeon we're in, and the special rules are here. So once the dungeon deck is done, take the same number of cards from the dungeoneer's deck in a separate pile. Choose one specific card that represents the bandit, and then mix that deck and place it next to the ordinary deck. Once you open a door, draw one card from this new deck. If you draw the card representing the bandit, you have found him. Roll for an encounter as usual, and then place the bandit in the far end of the room. We put aside these 11 cards of the Dungeoneer's deck to represent each one of the rooms in this particular dungeon. Let's see if our bandit from our side quest is there. And it is a 10 of diamonds. It is not. I put a bunch of random cards in here and put the Ace of Spades in here. The Ace of Spades is going to represent our bandit. All right, the tile is set. We went ahead and just put this door opposite the door we opened. And I've already changed the camera because the, <laughs> this game just needs you to change the camera all the time. So the thing we need to do next, I believe, is just check for an encounter. Rooms have a 50% chance of an encounter. So we'll roll in on a 0 to 50. We will find some enemies. So let's see what we get here. 57. All right, so as I understand it, I got a little confused on this too last time. We are above 50, so we don't have to encounter anything. This is one of the few roles where you're trying to get over, not under. And I'm looking right here on the encounter page in the booklet, and it says a room has a 50% chance of enemies on 0 to 50. So I believe we have not encountered anything in this first room. We can move on and do Neely's second action, which I think is just going to be a move action. building some suspense here. Might check out those levers. One, two, three, four. We'll move him there, move on to the next. So another hero gets to go. We'll go ahead and move Bomber, I believe just twice. One, two, three, four. Let me show you what we have increased for him. And our rogue, as I mentioned, is also level two. He has two luck and two energy. We did increase combat skill for him. And we got plus one movement because we picked a fast perk. So now we have plus one movement for him. He also, or that's a talent, the fast talent, excuse me. And the powerful blow perk, if we spend an 
energy, we get to roll an extra d6 of damage, and we declare that before our attack roll, which is just cool, making him all the more powerful. So we get five movement in this first go. If we go here, do we just set up near the door with a double move, which is kind of a waste, but yeah, I guess so. We'll use another point of movement as a second action here. And just be ready to open this door. Dorlin is going to go next. We increased range skill for him. Also increased perception for him because you only need to do a max of five point increase. And we picked... A strong build talent for him, giving him two more HP. And we have a Hunter's Eye perk now, which allows us to shoot two arrows at the same enemy with separate attacks if we spend the energy to do so. That's what he's working with now. We give Bomber some con. Nearly, we increased another stat as well. I believe we increased their dodge. Never we've got more HP because you roll a D2 on HP as well. So double move probably here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then Monty, our wizard. We increased some arcane for him. Gave him some more mana. I believe we increased his combat skill as well because it's pretty low. We gave him a powerful missile talent. So his magic missiles now do plus one damage. And we gave him the energy to mana perk. He can spend an energy and get plus five mana, which is really cool because he ran out of mana um, in some of his adventures earlier. So he'll move twice with six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Maybe we put him right here next to these levers. We need to start rolling our scenario die now. On a nine or a 10, we will have to roll against our threat, but let's roll that first and see what happens. Just keep it here, I guess. Oh, that is a three. I rolled the hundreds die, oh, accidentally, but it's still the same, so we'll call it a three. So no need to roll against threat right now. So now we can start with our hero actions. We do have a set of levers over here and we haven't seen those yet in a dungeon. So I may go ahead and shuffle up the lever deck to see what they might present us. Even though it's probably going to be terrible as most things in this type of game are, it's still fun to see how it works. So some rooms are equipped with levers, and activating these levers is, unless specified otherwise in the quest, purely optional, which makes it all the more dumb to even do them. But like I said, it's fun. So activating the correct lever may end up benefiting the party, but then activating the wrong one may cause some trouble. So when we prepare a lever deck, we are going to see how many are clustered together first. So we're going to shuffle a deck of standard playing cards, and the game comes with some. And we're going to take one black card and one d4 red cards. The black card represents something that is good. And the red cards are typically something that's bad. It costs one AP to pull one of these levers. So we'll see what happens when we do that. Let me grab this deck here. Roll a d4 to see how many red cards we throw into the mix. Four. So we're going to have a total of five red cards and one good one. So here's our small deck of League of Dungeoneer playing cards. So one, two, three, four. One, and we need one more red card. All right, so I pulled some cards out of the playing cards we get. We're going to shuffle them all together, and then Monty will pull the one lever, being the curious wizard that he is, and we'll roll on a table to see what happens.
All right, so go ahead and activate Monty's first action point, draw this card, and it is red. So we'll roll on the red lever table. So here we see the tables on pages 90 and 91 for the black and red levers. We'll roll a d20 and see which one happens for us. And we roll the natural 20. I'm sure that's going to be great. It says a rattling noise makes the hero look up, only to realize that an iron cage is descending from the roof. The cage encloses the hero that pulled the lever. At the same time, enemies appear at all doorways in the room. Roll once on the encounter table for each door in the room and place the enemies piled up just outside the doors. Any unopened door is now treated as unlocked and not trapped. In the turn and set up the initiative tokens. The hero trapped in the cage can do nothing until after the fight. Once the fight is over, the cage retracts. Party morale is reduced by one and the sanity of the cage hero by two. Yikes. Okay. We'll get all that done. We have some things set up here uh, according to what the lever did for us. Our wizard is not able to be used right now. And the first encounter we rolled to put out the first open door is this nasty guy, which is a shambler. Um, and he is really, really beefy. We'll, we'll look at him in just a moment. I want to mention why I have another corridor out here, though. I ask a few folks online what to do in this situation. Since the lever told us to put another encounter behind this door, uh, I was asking how I actually do that, because the door is now unlocked, not trapped, as the setup told us, but it's not open. So it's said to put enemies outside of the doors, and if this one's not open, I don't know exactly how I should have proceeded to do that. And suggestion that seemed to be the most popular was actually look ahead a little bit and count the second encounter being present in this next tile, even though we're not technically uh, privy to its information yet. So what we'll do is we'll put the encounter that we rolled for the second door in this room on this tile. We already know what it is, so it ruins the surprise a little bit, but it felt like the most logical way to proceed without having to open this door. And we'll have our hands full anyway, so I was okay moving forward. So that's kind of how we did that. It wasn't super clear, especially since it said to put each encounter for each door outside the door, and we couldn't quite do that without exploring anyway, or just having everyone cram inside the room, which is not what it said. So that's why the dungeon looks a lot more uh, explored than it actually is. This door is unlocked, not trapped, but it's not open yet. We'll go ahead and have an encounter when we roll in there. For now, we have to deal with a hulking shambler without our wizard. So the shambler, is a beast. It has a combat skill of 55, range skill 55, damage is a d12, resolve is a 55. It has no to hit penalties or bonuses. It does have natural armor of 2, however, movement of 5 and a dex of 25. It's large, so we reroll the damage and you get plus 10 to hit when it's shot out, and we also have entangled to deal with. It has 30 HP, 450 XP. If we're able to take it down with three heroes. Who knows, though? We'll see. Let's put some tokens in the bag, and then we'll proceed. Okay, so what I've done for tokens is one for the enemy, as usual, and three for the heroes. I haven't put a token in for Monty since he is stuck in a cage and can't do anything anyway until after this combat. And I'm not using perfect hearing because we are not encountering this enemy after we've opened a door. It's after we've triggered basically a trap by pulling the lever. So three and one is what we're dealing with, and we'll go to the bag right now and see who gets to act first. All right, we've got one of the heroes here. We might as well just turn, I think, and fire a shot with Dorlin who has a maxed out range skill. I, I showed his chart a little while ago and had his range skill up a little too high. I realized in between these two videos 
filming sessions that I had his range skill above the max, which is not legal. So we put the, the rest of the skills that we earned from our last level up into his constitution. All right, so let's go ahead and we will take a shot at this shambler. He's got plus 10 to hit, so I assume we do get to apply that. So we'll be at a 90, which is pretty insane. Put our dice up here. And he does have natural armor. So we'll subtract two from this. All right, yeah, so a 67 will hit for sure. I think I may spend an energy point to shoot twice. Yeah, I think I will do that. Let's roll damage on the first. We're technically supposed to declare that before we roll, but... Oh, max damage, nice. So 12 minus two for the natural armor will be 10. Get some damage tokens out. Here we've got seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. So second attack will deplete one energy. Do the second attack, second arrow here. What do we have? Oh, well, pretty high, but still going to hit because we're maxed out. Seventy-six. Oh, and we had the plus ten last time anyway, and this time, so definitely going to hit. Oh. Yeah. I just need to get within a 90. Let's roll damage again. Oh, and actually, we got to remember the longbow is armor piercing of one. So we'll take down one of those natural armors and do one more damage. So we 11. Here's another. Nice. 10. Minus one natural armor, so another nine down. Goodness gracious, crazy shots. That's an amazing first turn. All right, we got really lucky with the first bit of uh, attack and damage rolls there from our ranger. We'll move and reload here for our second action. One, two, three, and just kind of stay back here, bracing for this thing to come in. And I think we're hearing these guys bang on this door because the lever would have triggered them as well. And so we're starting to get a little nervous and we're eyeing Monty, uh, <laughs> blaming him with our eyes with what he has wrought. But let's move on to the bag here. See who gets to go next. All right, another hero can go. I think what we'll do might need to do some dodging or some parry stance stuff. This guy's just gonna have one AP. He can move four, two, three. And he can kind of pop up anywhere, just like in Descent. All right, yeah. We'll let Neely go. So one AP will go into Perry Stance. Yeah, I guess with our other AP, we'll just 
Let's move back. Yeah, we'll move. We'll just move back one, and then go into parry stance. All right, we'll go back to the bag here. Who do we have? All right, big guy. That was kind of what I was hoping for. I was hoping he would come to us. So he'll shrink down, move four, and he only has one action point, so he can only do that once. One, two, three, four, and just expand. And we'll change facing for Neely like this. Mm-hmm. And that's all he can do. He has activated. Bomber will go next. I think we're having plenty to get around here. But I'm not sure about the zone of control. I guess it's the two on the side still and everything around the front on the big bases. So one, two, would just be three, four, right? Ah, but we got an extra movement point with our fast talent that we bought so with five we can get to the back which is nice because we can ignore natural armor so let's go ahead and do that with a attack here we've got bomber holding our light source he's holding a torch and he's got a short sword in the other hand so here we go 1d6 plus 2 damage ignoring natural armor Need a 63 to hit. And we're not gonna do it with an 83. Okay. All right, well. Move on to the next round. All right, everything's back in the bag. go. I think we'll go ahead and get Neely to try that again so we don't waste any more ammunition. Go ahead and do this attack here. And you know what? Why don't we go ahead and expend one of our new perks, which is powerful blow. We get an extra d6 damage. We're going to declare that before the attack. So we'll spend one of our two energy. So we now have... If we hit this time... Get to add more damage. 88, gosh, again. Okay. Well, let's just use our second action to try to hit once again. 63 is pretty good. Do we spend? Uh, well, well, we'll save our energy here. We're in the first room. 60, all right, there we go. Now I can roll damage. Base damage for the short sword is just 1d6. Plus two. So five more damage on this guy. Five left. Back to the bag. Yeah, we ignored the armor because we we're behind him again. All right, bad guy. So we'll look at his beast AI card here. He is adjacent to a hero, so he's going to attack according to the table. He doesn't necessarily want to make room right now because there's no other bad guys in this room. So let's decide who he's going to attack. He can attack Neely or Bomber. So we'll roll this red die to the side. One to three will be Neely. Four to six will be Bomber. All right, so he's gonna attack Mr. Slate Strike. Um, let's go ahead and roll on this action table to see what he does. One to four will be um, a standard attack. And five to six, he would use his special talent, which he does have, which is um, an entangle. And we get to reroll damage if we hit here. So here we go. 
Look down a four. Yep, that's just a standard attack. So his attack is going to be a d12. We'll roll that 12 twice, take the higher. Six. And nine. Ouch. Okay. So let's see where the location is. One. Nine damage right there on the noggin. Uh, but he needs to roll an attack first. We'll save these rolls. So many rolls. 55 is what we're looking for. 80. Again, in the 80s. Are these cards throwing things off? Okay, so just a big miss. Mr. Barry Hill just dodged underneath that. All right, that's his go. Would have been bad, so I'm thankful he missed. All right, so we get you to decide um, if Dorling goes or Neely goes. I think Neely's going to go first. Um, we just need five damage, and I want to try to save as many arrows as we can. So, Mr. Slate Strike Neely here just has a 50-50 shot to attack with a CS of 50. Okay. All right. So here we go. Could do a power attack. Doesn't change anything to damage. Or we could just attack twice. I say we just attack twice because his health is so low. All right, so we need a 50. 31 will do. Damage is a D10 plus 2. Oh, and he does have armor piercing as well on the battle axe. So here we go. Come on, buddy. Damage. 4 plus Two. We killed that thing, y'all, without it ever landing a blow. Whoa, that is crazy. Just enough on the first attack for the Shambler to go down. Wow, all right. It was 450 XP. Uh, we have a part nearby, and we'll just take a minute to compose ourselves and return to the dungeon. Okay, so top of a new round, we need to roll a scenario die. And we have a three, so no need to roll against our threat, and we can begin our turn. So, that was quite the encounter to begin with in the first room, and we have some things coming in the next room. This is what have been what we encountered if this other door was open, if there's another door to stick something behind, so we just put it behind the next tile, so we know what's coming. And everyone looks angrily at Monty for a few moments, and he just does the typical <laughs> kind of thing, and now we're moving on. All right. Who wants to go first? I think we'll have Bomber move in. For one AP. Maybe we'll have him go last. And get these guys in place. One AP here. One AP here. We'll put Neely back in parry stance. Just kind of knowing that we had things knocking at the door. Go here. For power. For parry stance again. I'll move him here and open the door. All 
right, so we have everyone set up. We have one AP left from Bomber. He's going to open the door so we increase threat. We're up to eight. We're close to that wandering monster threshold. And we're going to open this door. And what we have behind is a corridor. It makes a sharp turn in the corner. Up against the wall sits a dead adventurer. By the look of it, he or she must have been there for a while since most of the flesh has been eaten away by God knows what. The adventurer can be searched. We also know, because this is what we rolled due to the lever, we're going to have this encounter in here. So we'll set that up and get ready to fight once again. Okay, here we are all set up in the dungeon. We did one thing to change our party morale. We increased it by two because we slew a large monster. We slew the Shambler. We need to also check this deck up here to see if our side quest objective is in here. It is not. Okay. And we set out four skeletons randomly and a necromancer. The reason the necromancer is so close is because we put the skeletons out first and the necromancer needed to be placed as far away from the heroes as possible, but within line of sight. And that's about as good as he could get. Um, and with so much combat going on right here at the beginning, I'm giving myself a little bit of a break. <laughs> so speaking of the necromancer, here he is. He's a magic user with a CS of 40, a range skill of 45. He does one damage. He has a resolve of 60. He's minus five to hit. He has one natural armor. For movement and 30 dex, he's a magic user. He may cast spells using his range skill as a skill value. And we also are facing four of these lower end dead skeletons. They have a 40 CS, a 20 RS, no damage, which is interesting. Their projectiles would just do two damage. They give bone meal as a part besides rolling on the treasure table one, and they have fear two, so resolve to attack. If we fail, it's minus 10. We might use one of our special perks to get past that if we can. They have a base of no damage because they have a long sword here, which does 1d12 damage. Also, they have shields. So, an intense battle here to begin. Uh, we need to roll a scenario die, and then we'll go to the bag. Five enemy chits in there, five hero chits because of perfect hearing. And here we go, here's our scenario die. That's a five. I think that's it. I think that's all we need to do here. This door will change out to an open one. For now, we'll just get going. All right, so we'll go to the bag. First off, we're going to go with an enemy. And we'll check our activation order here to see that a magic user or enemy with an arm with a ranged weapon would go first. So our necromancer is going to go first. So if he's adjacent to a hero, which he is, he would move up to movement, away but stay in line of sight. We have, you could do a close combat spell or make a standard attack, so we're just gonna roll a d6 to see if he attacks one of our friends here. So the spells our magic user has as his disposal are a frost ray, a teleportation, close combat spell, and raise dead. We chose the ranged and close combat spells randomly and raise dead was stipulated in our encounter table. So let's roll a d6 and see what this guy does. He is adjacent to a hero. He's gonna roll a five, so he's gonna make a, just a standard attack. Okay. So 
Here's the staff. It's the same one that we have on our wizard. So you'll use his combat skill, which is 40, and attack uh, one of the two heroes we have in his face. Let's say Bomber or Neely. One to three, four to six. All right, so he'll attack Neely. So let's make a combat skill check on him. And we're in parry stance here. So I keep forgetting that parry stance is just plus 15 to dodge and shield. So we have to choose to dodge, but I think we'll, we'll just wait for now. Just wanted to use that action point on all the heroes, you know. All right, so we need a 40. And we rolled a 90. So our Necromancer is not going to be able to hit. Just okay with us. So with the second action with our Necromancer, let's roll again on his magic user AI. A three again. Um, well, this is a close combat attack spell now. So we'll need to roll his combat skill. And he's going to try to use his teleportation. The wizard teleports herself to a random location on the same tile that is not adjacent to a non-allied character. If no such square is available, the wizard will instead end up in a random square in any random adjacent tile. Okay, so um, they're going to cast spells using range skill as a skill value. All right, so we'll use range skill, and I think I'm doing this right. Because they don't have mana. We're not tracking the mana of this Necromancer. They're just trying to teleport away. So their range skill is 45. So we're just trying to get to a 45 and see if they're successfully teleporting away. Oh yeah, and that's a 4. So they're going to do it. So they would teleport to... On the same tile, a random location that is not adjacent to a non-allied character. All right, so we'll use our D12 again. And kind of make that random. It says random, so we'll make it random if we can. All right, 11. One, two, three, nine, 10. Just counting this way, which would move there. Let's roll that again, because that would still make, make them adjacent. All right, that's two, so we'll say they moved back here. All right, next up. All right, back to the bag. And we've got another bad guy. So we'll activate an enemy. No enemies are adjacent. So we'll go enemy that is closest to a hero that could charge. And I believe this skeleton's got straight line of sight here to charge. So we'll do that. Okay, so we'll move him in. He's going to charge at Neely. Make a combat check here. At plus 10. And 86 will be unsuccessful. So they're staggered, even if it does not lose HP. Yeah, so that's the stagger only happens if the charge is successful. So he just charges forward and misses. All right, next up. The charge attack is 2 AP, so that's all he has. All right, another bad guy. So I think we've got another charge coming because this guy can now charge since our Necromancer has moved. So he'll move up to here, use his combat skill to try to hit. Which is 50. And we got 73. So these guys aren't rolling that great, which I'm okay with, you know. All right, that was two AP for the skeleton, so we're back to the bag. And we finally have a hero. Neely and or... Bomber. 
number. Who wants to go? Let's go with Neely first. We'll just do a standard attack. Put the guy right in front of us. And these guys do have shields and they have minus five to hit. No natural armor though. So we're looking at a 40 with our battle axe. And we rolled a 92, yeah, so that's the first one is not gonna hit. Second attack here. Hey, it's an eight. So let's roll some damage. And max damage of 12. So we're going to take out a skeleton. Awesome. Let's go back just quickly because we need to do a fear test in order to attack these skeletons. If it's less than or equal to two. We need to do resolve test and a failure would result in negative 10 of our skills versus that target. Okay, but we're gonna use encouraging. Spin one of our energy, which is gonna give us plus 10 on those resolve checks for our friends. Let's roll our resolve check to see if we could have done that attack. And oh yeah, a four. So we're gonna get some resolve back. It's great, because it's pretty low. So yeah, we could have done that attack. Just a little out of order there, apologies for that. All right, well that's good. Now back to the bag. So we have another hero here that gets to go. I think we'll let our other frontline enemy facing hero here go. We might get them to move as a first action, do some backstabbing as a second action. Yeah, let's try that. So we'll move diagonally one, two, and three to get back behind this skeleton. No natural armor here, but it does help clear the way. Oh, but should we do, should we actually get in here? So then our archer and Monty has something to do. Let's do that. So we moved three, one, two, did the zoning control. Um, we go three and we'll be right here facing this skeleton. Let's try that instead. Do have one more energy here, so well, should we save our energy? Just considering using, I'll save it. I'll consider using it later. But let's roll. Um, these guys are minus ten to hit because of their to hit bonus and their shield. So let's go ahead and roll our combat check. We now have a sixty-three. We increase some of the combat we had. Uh, but first we got to do a resolve check to see if we're able to attack or else we'll be at minus 10. Here we go. Ah, 55 does not succeed in the fear. So we're going to be at minus 10. Let's find the token for that. We'll put it on our party sheet. We 
go. We have some bats on this token to show that we are afraid. All right, so we need a 53 typically, and then we need another minus 10. So we need a 43 for this to hit. That's our second action here. 54, that is a miss. So we'll go back to the bag. All right, another good guy. I wonder if we shouldn't actually move in as a strategy and try to take out this skeleton with Doralyn so they would not get a turn. I think we might do that, so we'll move one, two, three, four. Stand on this corpse and take a straight shot over at this skeleton that hasn't gone yet. Standing on his corpse. All right, let's do a fear test. Resolve of our dear elf is 40. So I'm just now remembering that we had a plus 10 to our resolve. So we would have actually succeeded in the fear test, but still would have missed. We were one point away from hitting this skeleton. So um, we have a plus 10 for Dorlin as well in this resolve test. I'm actually reading zone of control too. And it says we have two points of movement that we need to use when moving from one zone of control square to another zone of control square. So I don't think we would have actually used two here. So I think we have one more point of movement. So this is moving into this zone of control. As far as I'm reading, it doesn't count as two. It only counts when we're moving within the zone of control. So it would be one, two, three, four. And then I think we could take a shot at the Necromancer, which I think might be worth it. So let me know if I did that zone of control movement correctly. And I have seen a few things online that say <clears throat> you have to pay more to enter it and more to exit it, but <laughs> it doesn't seem like there's a, an actual consensus. If I read it, but from how I am reading it, it says moving in zone of control cost two, not necessarily in or out. So I'm gonna say, we're able to do this right here. And we might even be able to trace line of sight to this guy. Anyway, we were back here. Get really close to that wall. Yeah. You know what? We'll just we'll just do this. We'll stay back here saying we still have line of sight. It's precarious on the necro. Get pretty close to that wall, but we'll call it close enough. And we may have had another movement point to get closer anyway. So we'll just kind of, we'll call it like that right now. All right, so let's take a shot. This is our second of two actions at the Necromancer. We need a range skill of 80. So let's go ahead and roll that. Okay. Under 80, yeah. The 53, that should be fine. And we do have an armor piercing skill here so we can ignore the natural armor that this necromancer has. And we are indeed rolling a d10. So here we go. Oh boy, just a big fat one. Well, every little bit helps, right? Okay, that's it for that hero. Let's go back to the bag. All right, hey. So Monty is up here. Let's see what he wants to do. His magic missiles are more powerful, but we don't really have any range on anybody. I think we're gonna have to move. We 
we'll just move down one and cast a flare. Casting value on this is eight. It's going to use up 15 mana. All right, so our arcane is 65. Subtract 8 from that, meaning we will need a 57 here. But first, let's do a Resolve check at plus 10. His Resolve is 37. We'll make it a 47. See if we're fearful here. We are with a 72. Definitely fearful. All right, so we now need a 55. Minus another 10, so really just a 45 because of the shield and the, the hit change. Oof, okay. Forty-five, let's go. Forty-eight. Oh no. Yeah, so it doesn't go off, so we only take up half mana. That will be the last hero's go, so we should have two skeletons left to act with. All right, so looking at our enemy activation card here, we have done something with our magic user. We don't have an adjacent enemy here that can make room for more, but we do have an enemy adjacent to a hero, so we're going to activate this skeleton first. And let's see what they're going to do. Armed with a missile weapon, they're not... Um, if they're adjacent to a hero, we're going to attack according to the table. And we'll roll a d6 to see if they do a power attack or a standard attack. It's a 6, so they will do a power attack. So this will be at plus 20 to hit. The combat skill is 40, so this needs to be under a 60. And it is with a 30. Okay, we'll roll damage and location. Just one damage, and the location is a six, which is the legs. So are we wearing anything on our legs? Bomber, we are not. So we're just gonna get hit for one damage in the legs. Not too bad, in all honesty. He's down to 12, our first blood taken, which is pretty good. Um, considering all the things we've faced so far. That's him gone. Let's see what this guy wants to do. He might charge. Probably would charge down here. So here's a power attack token. We'll put that right here next to this guy. And then he's going to charge up to his movement. Yeah, I think here. Actually, the lower and dead doesn't, doesn't say anything about charge. It just says you're just going to move. Within two, yeah, if within movement spaces of a hero, move adjacent to the closest hero. Yeah, so I don't think he would charge, to be perfectly honest. All right, let's do an attack here. Yeah, 17. These guys are rolling well. Damage and hit location. Four and four. So torso, four damage going through. We do have a leather vest which is a defense of three, so one will take off a durability and one hit point from Bomber. Or two, excuse me, padded jacket here. Two and two, two's going down. All 
right, with that, we'll put everything back in the bag and start a new round.